So now I'd like to get the program started by uh, welcoming the chairman, president, and CEO of Polycom, Robert Haggerty, who will introduce our next speaker. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. You know, as I was going back to my room last night, I was reflecting on yesterday. What a fantastic set of speakers. What a great day. I hope you all enjoyed it in this beautiful setting that we're all in. I have the uh, pleasure today of introducing um, our first speaker. Um, you know, at the age of 22, Gary Kasparov became the youngest world chess champion. Since 1984, he's been number one ranked player in the world and is regarded as one of the best chess players in the world and actually the best chess player of all time. Chess is the ultimate competition, and Garry Kasparov is the ultimate strategist. Chess pieces, kings, knights, bishops, evoke a world of medieval politics, but the principles of chess seize the initiative. Play for the center. Watch your opponent's moves. Play with a plan. These apply to the demands of business strategy. In business, as in chess, understanding the game, the competition, the board, and yourself is essential. But strategy can only take you so far. Often, only intuition can deliver an extraordinary breakthrough. It is intuition that helps you achieve your full potential as an individual and achieve superior performance as the leader of an organization. In his best-selling book, How Life Imitates Chess, Kasparov, distills the lessons he has learned over a lifetime as the Grand Master. The book is a primer on successful decision-making, how to evaluate opportunities, anticipate the future, devise winning strategies in a global marketplace. He relates in a lively, original way the nuts and bolts strategy, as well as in subtler, more human arts of developing personal style, using memory, intuition, imagination, and even fantasy. As Gary himself says, decisiveness comes from the courage to trust, trust your instincts. The more you trust, the more you will build up that intuition and the more accurate it will become, creating a positive cycle. Polycom customers have long emphasized the importance of building trust through human connection and collaboration in a global business, as well as the importance of seeing, hearing reactions of your opponents, your partners, and your customers face to face. As many of you know, less than two weeks ago, Gary announced that he's running for the office of President of Russia. Please join me in wishing Gary the best of luck in his political campaign and welcoming to him to the World Business Forum. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. It's early, I can see some people coming in. But in Russia, it's 4.30 in the afternoon. It's, this time, jet lag has clearly worked to my advantage. I thought I would need to introduce myself a little, but it was already done. Yeah. But um, still, a few words. Uh, we all know that chess has rarely made front pages here in America. Unfortunately, Russian politics appears slightly more often today. But, but things are improving in that regard. And uh, I uh, hardly ever hear, aren't you that guy who played the IBM computer? <laughs> but I have to confess that I use this trick uh, when I face um, a nasty immigration officer asking about the purpose of my trip to America. When I exhaust all other options, I say, I'm the guy who played the computer. It's um, quite possible that my recent selection um, as the opposition candidate for the presidency in Russia received more cover coverage outside of Russia than in my country where media is under very tight Kremlin control. Um, they say it takes some courage to run for president in Putin's Russia. Uh, judging from the number of candidates here in the US, I guess in this country, it takes even more courage not to run. <laughs> so 
So perhaps because the game of chess is so strongly associated with intelligence, all my life I have been asked how I succeeded. And when I became the youngest uh, world chess champion at age 22, there were many myths about my abilities, uh, about my life, that I uh, spoke eight or ten languages, I ate a special uh, brain food, had a photographic memory, and saw dozens of moves ahead during the game. All myth, unfortunately. My wife Dasha can tell you that I'm capable of forgetting appointments and birthdays. <laughs> and as for foods, I don't think the world is yet ready for Kasparov diet book. <laughs> I have a photo from those um, good old days and I'd like to share. Perhaps it should be titled The Connection Between Wisdom and the Hair Loss. <laughs> Look at all that hair, huh? And um, it's, it's the next day. I won the title on the 9th and on the 10th there was a closing ceremony. I received uh, the laurel and everything else. And in the midst of this celebration, I was approached by Rona Petrosian, the wife of the former world chess champion Tigran Petrosian. And uh, she looked at me and she said something that made me stunned. She said, young man, I'm sorry for you. What? It's, I'm the world champion at age 22. The world is yours. The sky's the limit. Sorry? She said, yes. I'm sorry for you because the happiest day of your life has just passed. <laughs> so the bad news is that she might have been right. <laughs> the good news is that it gave me a new goal to prove her wrong. As, um, as is usually the case, my secret was no secret at all. All success is based on combination of things. Talent requires hard work. Calculations requires evaluation. Good strategy requires good tactics to succeed. And many assume that chess players are very good, are gifted in mathematics. But I have to tell you that in school, I strongly preferred history and literature. Okay, disappeared, okay. I'm getting upset. <laughs> but I uh, did recently write a book. However, um, not a diet book. And if I, if I don't mention this book today, mm, we, we will discover which is more dangerous, the KGB or an angry New York editor. <laughs> Anik, hello. It's, as, as was already said, the title is How Life Imitates Chess. And um, it's not a recommendation to learn chess, although the game has a lot to offer. It's uh, my attempt to break down the decision-making process. I'm trying to share my own experience as a decision-maker and um, uh, analyzing the tools, the tools that chess gave to me to um, make decisions and to analyze these decisions uh, in, in, other, in other walks of life. And uh, uh, I believe that everyone in every field at work or you know, in their personal lives can benefit from careful consideration of their own mind and their own results and how these results were achieved. So I'm going to jump around here a little, you know, from one side to another today, discussing everything from psychology, war in Iraq and American presidents from George the first to George the third. I counted correctly, huh? <laughs> it's no, no insult, just counted. <laughs> when I retired from chess in March 2005 um, to move into politics, of course I was questioned about my style. Because everybody knew I was an aggressive player. And people questioned, the experts, um, the journalists, questioned uh, my ability to survive in, uh, in this um, tricky world of political affairs. Um, your Theodore Roosevelt said to speak softly and carry the big stick. 
for most of 25 years of my professional career, I followed his advice halfway. My method was to carry a big stick. <laughs> and if that didn't work, I came back carrying even a bigger stick. But it worked for me, so what should I say? And uh, I, I believe that you have to do what, uh, what you know the best. But just don't get me wrong, it's, my chest was not that one-sided. Um, the reason I rejected the doubts about uh, my ability to survive in this world of politics, because I knew that I always was good at reading what we call in chess demands of the position. If position demanded to be quiet and to defend, I could do it. Because at the end of the day, it's about winning or losing. It's not about uh, displaying your ego. Um, and I knew that I could learn the new skills. And I think we all can do it, no matter how little hair we have left. And second, what's wrong with being an attacker? Is it ineffective? or just unpopular to point, to point out that um, being aggressive is just as successful in business and politics as in chess, especially when you are fighting authoritarian regime that, that ignores those who speak softly. And I'm here today to make the case for the offense. So you often hear that people in um, every area of competition uh, talk about doing their best and not worrying about winning. Of course, it's important to give your best effort. But no one grows up dreaming about becoming vice president. <laughs> At least in the beginning. <laughs> An Olympic runner, let's talk about track and field, uh, who breaks the world record, but comes in second, would happily trade this great achievement for a gold medal. Or you can ask uh, John Kerry how he feels about receiving the second highest popular vote in US history. Attacking can be broken in two categories. One, the direct assault. It's easy to understand. That's a big stick and even a bigger stick. Second is maintaining the initiative, which is more sophisticated concept. The initiative means creating the action, creating the action instead of reacting. It means being at the front so you can see what's, uh, what's happening and what's coming and better control the environment. And when your opponent is reacting, he gradually loses ground, allowing you to extend your lead at his expense. And this leads to a direct attack that cannot be defended against. And that's what I call the attacker's advantage. The initiative is not only desirable, but once you have it, it becomes an obligation. Having the lead means you must. You must attack or the position will turn against you. Having played aggressively, you rarely have the opportunity to slow down and consolidate. And of course, you offer your opponent a chance to counterattack. In business, it means giving your competitor a chance to catch up and pass you. Consider uh, Apple's strategy was one of the most successful consumer products of all time, the iPod. The Mini was still incredibly popular when Apple introduced another line, the Nano. Instead of waiting around and counting their money, they pushed their, uh, their advantage. Steve Jobs didn't have to go to the United Nations to seek approval for his preemptive attack on the market. In business, the best attack is always preemptive. And also rem remember that an opponent, a competitor, or a rival candidate who is under pressure is more likely to make a mistake. If you're number two and you're trying to be number one or to avoid being pushed back to number three or four, pressure is the best way to get results. But of course, I will add a cautionary tale. When I was um, a rising teenage star, I experienced problems uh, with Tigran Petrosian, the above mentioned uh, world champion, ex -world, former world champion. Uh, we played two games and I lost both. And I was so close and just in, uh, uh, by, um, to crush his position. But the victory both times slipped through my fingers. Uh, Petrosian uh, was a great defensive player and uh, he 
played it against, he played my aggression against me as a torrid or against the bull. So you lost once, it's, um, um, it might be an accident, but you lost twice the same way, so you think that something was wrong. Um, and next time we, uh, we met at an important tournament in Yugoslavia, um, I got an advice from another former world champion, Boris Pesky, who took the title from Petrosi in 1969. Uh, so before the game, Spassky counseled me that the best way to succeed against Petrosian is to apply pressure steadily. Boris said, squeeze his balls. <laughs> but don't rush, squeeze one, not both. <laughs> of course I won the game, and how could I not after receiving such immortal advice? So if you stay aggressive and things don't work as planned, you will at least learn something. Mistakes of inaction, I believe that mistakes of inaction are psychologically harder to deal with. We always regret missed opportunities more than misplayed attacks. Of course, occasionally there are consequences so disastrous that sitting around sounds attractive. For example, let us not avoid the big issues and let us go directly to the war in Iraq. It's always essential to analyze our past decisions. It's critical to understand why we succeed, not only why we fail. That's everybody is doing this, but nobody wants to look at uh, success because we believe if we won, it's, it's because we're great. It's a human complacency. And uh, we should not only consider the results itself. A good plan can fail with bad implementation and vice versa. And as time went on in Iraq after the initial invasion, it looks, for me, like the bad implementation of no plan. But do not misunderstand me. I grew up under a totalitarian government, and I have no pity for dictators. Freedom and democracy are not mere words to anyone from the former Soviet Union or the current Russia. And I'm in favor of using the moral authority and might, if necessary, of the civilized world to bring those ideals to the oppressed. And the people of Iraq clearly qualified. But what was the plan? If the plan has been to uproot terror and make America and the world safer, the US had an ideal opportunity in May 2003 to move on. The mighty Iraqi army has been destroyed in a few weeks, and 140,000 coalition troops were right next to two major terrorist sponsors, Iran and Syria. The leaders of those nations must have been shaking their boots. Stop supporting terror or you are the next. This message would not be ignored in May 2003. Instead, the coalition started nation building in Iraq and let the initiative slip away. As on the chessboard, if you don't use the initiative, it will quickly turn against you. It took nearly a year for Iran and Syria to regain their confidence. And by 2004, the wave of terrorist attacks had spread across Iraq. And here I'll invoke another American president for the purpose of disagreeing with him. Thomas Jefferson is quoted as saying, delay is, preferably, is, is preferable to error. This is true only if delay itself is not an error. Worse, inaction can become habit forming, especially today when we all have so much information coming in all the time. And it's tempting to keep waiting and waiting, accumulating more and more data so we can make Perfect decisions. There are no perfect decisions. The attacker's advantage comes only to those who are not afraid to trust their instincts. It all begins with having the courage to fail. Courage to fail. We all suffer from self-doubt, all, even myself. And we all suffer failure. I was number one 
in the world of chess, number one ranked player for 20 years. And I won throughout my professional career hundreds of games, hundreds and hundreds of games. But I also lost dozens of games. Dozens of times I sat at the chessboard and fought hour after hour before being forced to resign. And each of these defeat, defeats still causes me pain. Failure is acceptable and inevitable as long as you are not content with it. And I'm going to borrow another one of your founding fathers. I apologize, but I'm afraid I never found much to admire in the founders of the USSR. <laughs> Learn from George Washington, who not only failed frequently, but was far from confident, at least in private. He resigned from militia several times over disputes with his superiors early in his career. And on the day he was selected to be commander in chief of the colonial armies in 1775, he had this to say to his confidant, Patrick Henry. Oh. From the day I entered the command of the American armies, I date my fall and the ruin of my career. Not the sort of thing you carve into a monument. <laughs> Another form of courage is learning to absorb criticism. Not ignore it, but learn from it without letting it distract you. And listen to some of the book reviews. The characters are shallow. This isn't a kindergarten for amateur writers. Sentimental rubbish. Those were the words of authority for Ernst Hemingway, Rudyard Kipling, and Leo Tolstoy. I think they turned out all right. You must um, be self-aware enough to notice the effect criticism has on you. Does it make you defensive and more set in your ways? Does it depress you? Knowing your own mind helps you, helps you um, make better decisions. Emotions, not to be avoided, only controlled. Anger and stress can be directed into useful energy, energy to prove your critics wrong. Don't whine, don't complain. Instead, plot and conspire. <laughs> Plan and work harder than ever. It's OK to be angry as long as you're taking, taking your range out on solving the problem. So now I want to move to the meat and potatoes. So to begin, let us look at the list on this slide. Any idea what these names have in common? Let's talk about innovation to start on a positive note. The Wright brothers flew the flew a heavier than aircraft in 1903. Vank was the early pioneer in electronic calculators and word processors in the 60s and reached billions in revenues in the 80s. The search engine Alta Vista was, a, um, was the first searchable database on the internet a, a decade ago, just a decade ago. And the Rio brought dig digital music players to the masses in 1998 beginning the obsolescence of portable CD players, and some would say endangering the entire entertainment industry. Pioneers. Now let's look at the another list. Of course, this list is directly related to the last one. The first list could be called pioneers, and all respect is due them. But the first list, just look at this list again can be also called things we do not do anymore. <laughs> when, I, when I flew to New York a couple of days ago, Delta, direct service to New York, I did not fly on the Wright Brothers airplane. I did not use a Vang laptop on that flight. I did not listen to Rio MP3 player. And if you want to find out what's happened with Alta Vista, well, you can Google it. <laughs> I 
On this day, October 11th, in 1910, ex-president Theodore Roosevelt became the first US president to fly in an airplane. This plane, what an irony, actually had been built by the Wright brothers. So what's happened? Their breakthrough was probably one of the greatest inventions in the human history. But they did not believe it was good for business. They did not believe that the airplane can haul cargo and uh, fly passengers long distance. They lack the commercial vision to complement their technical expertise. But everything was changed by a carrier engineer with unique entrepreneurial instincts entering the aviation business. His name was William Boeing. Back in 1910, William Boeing didn't even know how to fly. A and he was living in Seattle, Washington, far from where most aeronautic research um, was going on in the East. Boeing didn't have the technical knowledge of the Wright brothers. What he had was a vision, a vision of the potential of flight and the ability to develop a strategy to achieve it. In the next few years, Boeing did several remarkable things to accomplish his vision of creating a commercial airplane business. Boeing paid for a wind tunnel to be built at the um, University of Washington so the school could offer aeronautic courses so Boeing had human resources he needed nearby. In 1917, fighting to win a contract, he boxed up planes like Pizza to ship them by train across the country to Florida where the Navy was testing new aircraft. This was one of the creative tactics Boeing used to keep his vision and strategy alive. He continued to hire the most talented engineers and invest in research even when there was no market. But when ma mail delivery and passenger travel propelled by Charles Lindbergh, historic uh, New, York, um, New York to Paris flight in 1927, created a real boom, William Boeing and his strategy of superior technology were there and waiting. Side by side, for reasons as different as the items on that list, the names on this first list were all surpa surpassed by, it, by, the, by the competition. The common denominator is what I call the gravity of past success. Success can blind you to your own weaknesses, make you over-conservative or over-optimistic, and hold you back. So admire the names on the first list but consider which list you would prefer to be on. Now let's apply our themes of courage and vision to the biggest picture of all. According to the latest issue of Foreign Policy magazine, 91% of experts believe that the world is becoming more dangerous for the United States today. Only 2% say safer. I suspect the remaining 7% were too frightened to answer. So how can we begin to think about a problem as big as the war on terror? Last year, I spoke at the centenary, centenary celebration in honor of the, uh, in, in, to honor the great Austrian mathematician, Kurt Gödel in Vienna. Gödel was as crucial and revolutionary for mathematics in the 20th century as Einstein was for physics. Several of his important theories have relevance outside of mathematics. One states that every system will contain a problem that cannot be solved from within the system itself. Cannot be solved from within the system itself. When known methods cannot provide solutions, you must examine your methods and look outside of the system to rise above it. After the First World War, we had the Versailles Treaty and the creation of the League of Nations. The League was a failure, and the unwillingness to accept it, accept this fact, led to the World War II. After the Second World War, we had the United Nations, designed to freeze conflicts and to avoid a mega conflict between nuclear superpowers. Now, after the Cold War, we again need fresh ideas, fresh ideas, new organization that, that are based on the new global dividing lines of the value of human life and democracy. The old stalemate diplomacy of the Cold War will not help us 
against suicide bombers. So together with the new organizations, we need to recognize our enemies and their weapon. And I'm not talking about this famous WMD, wherever they are. We don't want to face the fact that much of the money that is spent on oil goes to support terror and suppress democracy around the globe. Iran, Saudi Arabia, Sudan, Algeria, Venezuela, and unfortunately, a key player in this oily political field is Putin's Russia. Seeing the bigger picture means realizing everything is connected. Putin badly needs oil revenues to sustain his grip on power. Russia sells nuclear technology to Iran and missiles to Hezbollah and Hamas via Syria. It, lead, it leads to rising tension in the Middle East and to the high oil prices. And most of the Islamic terrorist groups are funded by Middle East oil money and can launch more attacks. They are fed by the civilization dependence on the 19th century device, the internal combustion engine, 19th century device. The Iraq debate has been reduced to black and white, which should be left to the chessboard, trust me. All we hear is, do we stay, do we go? Do we stay, do we go? But troop withdrawal should be considered only a small part of an overall strategy. It's not just troops. It's not just Iraq. It must be decided in the context of action, of restoring transatlantic solidarity, standing up to Iran, dealing with Hamas, Saudi funding of Wahhabi extremism, serious support of terrorism, and the list goes on and on. This is not a generic political case, and, uh, case study and strategy. These things have real world consequences for all of us. In chess, we know that a subtle, subtle move on one side of the board can have a decisive effect on the other side of the board. And let us look again to history of, for examples. On another October 11, this time in 1939, Teddy's cousin, Franklin Roosevelt, received a letter, a letter from Albert Einstein. This famous letter described the possibility of a bomb based on a nuclear chain reaction. It did not receive a great deal of attention at that time. It was over two years later when the Manhattan Project was formed to develop the first atomic bomb. It sounds slow today. Two years. Two years uh, can transform a technology. But Roosevelt deserves credit for investing in what might, must have sounded like science fiction in his time. And credit for continuing it uh, with, with, with the project when Pearl Harbor occurred the very day after he approved the formation of Manhattan Project. A man with lesser vision would have said that the money would be needed for building more tanks and ships. In June of 2004, I wrote an editorial talking about big picture and the war on terror. It was essential, I said, to launch a massive initiative for um, independence from oil in order to combat terrorists who are mostly funded by oil revenue. I wrote, Kennedy challenged America to go to the moon, and today, a similar ambitious plan is required. Oil isn't only fuel for cars, it's fuel for terror. The end of quote. Strange to quote myself. <laughs> but it was, it was even stranger, you know, stranger feeling to watch the latest Republican presidential debate last Tuesday. Not one, but two candidates mentioned the need for a new moon landing project for energy independence. So do you like to hear my uh, ideas for tax policy? <laughs> so candidates talking about energy independence is great news. It's no matter what, great news. But even this is only one part of a larger equation. Kennedy wasn't just throwing money around to beat the Soviets. And he wasn't trying to talk about ethanol to improve the Iowa voters. The space program provided a powerful economic, scientific, and psychological push for the American people. And few remember that in 1958, a senator from Massachusetts spoke in Congress in favor of legislation called, called the National Defense Education Act. National Defense Education Act. Then Senator John F. Kennedy said that the future of the United States was very dark 
if people cared more about sport events than science and education. Education as national defense. That's a long-term vision and seeing the larger framework. An equally critical element in the new framework is human rights. Engagement and appeasement are, are falling as they have always failed. Hezbollah, Iran, North Korea, you name it, all continue to exist in a world of minimal accountability for the dangers they represent. The so-called leaders of the free world talk about promoting democracy while treating the leaders of the world's most autocratic and dangerous regimes as equals. Today, the United Nations places countries like Cuba and Libya on the Human Rights Committee, guaranteeing a permanent state of inaction. Russia is made a member of G7. I still can't pronounce G8. G7 stood for seven great industrial democracies. Adding Russia to the list makes it a mockery. So G7 supposedly was an exclusive club of democratic nations. But Putin is there despite his demolition of our democratic institutions. We need a new organization based on the global Magna Carta, a declaration of inalienable human rights that all member nations must recognize. Without enforcing our guiding standards, we are being dragged down to the level of the lowest common denominator. No one can remain neutral in this fight. As Dante wrote, hell itself would not receive those undecided in neutrality. Hell itself. The nations that believe in democracy and the value of human life are in ascendance today. They control the vast majority of world economic and military resources. If they band together and refuse to coddle the rogue regimes and sponsors of terror, their authority will be irresistible. Will this initiative be exploited or will be allowed to fade away as it did in Iraq? At our fight in Russia today is based on those same universal values of human rights. We are not fighting to win elections at this point. We're fighting just to have elections. And Putin's latest maneuvers have received many headlines, but they're part, part of the same charade. He and his buddies are trying to stay in power, no matter the structure, no matter the cost. It is not the USSR. And I think it's, uh, it's not correct by making this comparison. Oh, things in Russia, they are much better than 25 years ago. Well, why not comparing the two to 1996 or 1997? Not that I'm praising uh, democracy in Yeltsin's days, but at least we had some democratic institutions, also weak and flawed, flawed, but they could serve as a foundation for the future. Putin and his gang revived many of the old uh, Soviet uh, means. Control of media, total control of media, puppet judiciary, and stage manager elections. The epic corruption of Yeltsin's years now have been surpassed by a government in which politicians, the oligarch, and the crooks are one and the same. Aristotle himself couldn't find a better definition of the oligarchy that we have today in Kremlin. Top Putin administration members chair some of the largest corporations in the country, Gazprom, Rosneft, Transneft, and again, the list goes on. You might even wonder whether there is a Russian term for conflict of interest. <laughs> and this has serious implications also for foreign investors. The high price of oil and uh, other na Russian natural resources has kept things relatively stable. And many groups are making a quick buck by doing business under Kremlin rules. But there is no such thing as easy ruble when dealing with mafia. Even the largest foreign companies and investors are not immune, as Shell found out when Kremlin impolitely pushed it out uh, um, uh, from the Sakhalin 2 gas fields uh, last year. Now, piece of advice. If you want to invest in KGB Incorporated, you must remember that they are very, very active shareholders. <laughs> Making even Carl Icahn pale by comparison. <laughs> Putin in Russia is not corrupt. Corruption is the system. It's like a bizarre combination of Adam Smith and Karl Marx. 
state profits are privatized while expenses are nationalized. <laughs> Perhaps 15% of Russians are benefiting from the boom that is, um, that, that is visible in the center of Moscow or St. Petersburg. The other 120 million that other Russia is why the things are not stable in my country. And yet I constantly hear about Vladimir Putin's popularity in Russia in the Western press. In a country without free media, polls cannot be trusted. They cannot be useful. Every television station and every ma major outlet is under the direct control of Kremlin or Putin's closest cronies. If the White House had total media control and pervasive security forces, I think Bush and Cheney could also enjoy 75% popularity. It's, it's not an idea. <laughs> so this is uh, to the conclusion. This is a fight I've chosen, and many others along with me. I'm often asked about my personal safety, physical safety. But things, think, of, um, think of thousands and thousands of activists all across Russia, those who do not have even the minimal protection of a famous name. And do not think that their courage is far removed from, you, from your day-to-day -day existence. Courage is essential in every walk of life, beginning with the courage to make up your mind. Fear comes in many forms related to the decision-making. Fear, the fear of being wrong, the fear of change, fear of the unknown, the fear of hurting those who are important to us. And failure to control these fears leads to slower and fewer decisions, and in turn, to the greater fear next time. Decisions to take on big ideas, big challenges, do not require any more physical efforts than the small ones. Have the courage to look closely at how you make your decisions and the results. Look closely at the results. Have the courage to think big. Have the courage to go on the attack. The way to overcome doubt and fear is to trust, to trust our instincts, to trust our potential, to trust yourself. And you can also trust the man on the $20 bill, my last American president today, who said, one man with courage makes a majority. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Where is my... Ladies and gentlemen, I'm please welcome HSM Director Jose Salibi. Morning. We have about uh, 10 minutes for a few questions here for Gary. Gary, uh, a lot of personalities, uh, sports and games and artists, uh, after they finish their you know, normal activity with their talent. So they choose, you know, in, in a way, an uh, uh, easier life or a fun life. Uh, you, you seem to be choosing a, quite an interesting, a dangerous <laughs> uh, way of life. What, what drives you? I think I explained. <laughs> <laughs> I spent 50 minutes in counting the rationale <laughs> for this decision. But frankly speaking, um, Chess in the Soviet Union was a part of uh, a big ideological picture because for the communist regime, chess was uh, a tool to demonstrate the advantage or superiority of the communist regime over the decadent West. So that's why being a part of this, um, of this game and the, first the challenge and then the world champion, I was in, engaged in, uh, in political battles and I had to take on Anatoly Karpov, who was the darling of the system, and fighting Karpov to a certain extent, I was fighting the system itself. 
And for many people in my country in 84, 85, 86, those the, the, the years where Gorbachev took over and the beginning of perestroika and glasnost, uh, my matches with Karpo were symbols, symbolic, symbolic fights between the old and new. And uh, I, um, I sensed that I was already part of this political fight. And uh, I uh, came in and out for almost 20 years into Russian political life because I believe that if, if I remained inactive, that would be a very bad sign for those who uh, followed me and who could think that if the world champion, such a famous person, is afraid, so what could we do? So it was more about encouraging other people. But when I decided to move from chess somewhere else, I don't think I had a choice because I saw what, what had been happening with my country under Putin, and I have been playing for, for, for my country for 25 years, and I don't want to see, to, to, to see my country to collapse the same way it happened with the Soviet Union in 1991, and um, not being paranoid about my influence in Russian politics uh, after uh, my influence was exercised in the world of chess, I still believe that I could make some difference. And for me, making the difference was the key element for every decision. I believe I could make a difference. I think I'm making some difference. And I, I'm, I have no regrets about my decision. What, what's your view for the other side of Russia? What, what, what would you like to see happening? How did you see the future? Look, um, you can read in the Western press a lot of stories about uh, Putin rebuilding all-powerful Russian state. In fact, it's, it's not probably all true because Putin, in fact, is destroying the state by removing uh, financial powers uh, uh, into this large corporation. For instance, uh, two months ago, Russian parliament voted uh, mm, a new legislation that allowed Rosneft and Gazprom to have their own armies. So it's more like a feudal state. It's, I don't think this, this, this construction is stable, and I think that uh, unless we change it, unless we restore democracy in Russia, uh, this entity called Russian Federation may cease to exist uh, in, uh, in um, uh, the nearest future. Is, is there anything that the international community do for you to, to help uh, with this uh, new thinking? Or, or, or is there too much focus on the Iraq and the Middle East and that they're not enough focus in Russia? No, uh, the only thing we, 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 uh, we kept asking the leaders of the free world is just not to apply double standards. You can't try to build democracy in Iraq at the expense of democracy in Russia. And uh, uh, what we want is just to state the obvious. Uh, if Putin acts like Lukashenko or Mugabe, he cannot be treated as the leader of a democratic nation. And uh, uh, don't underestimate the importance of the criticism that, c that comes from Washington of, or from European capitals, because unlike uh, Soviet dictators, Putin is not immune for this criticism. Uh, he could be um, attacking in, even indirectly U.S. interests uh, uh, worldwide by uh, making friends with China, Iran, or other countries, but all the money of Russian ruling elite is kept in the free world. If you want to find out where the, these huge profits are prominently displayed, um, you can go to South Kensington in London, not to uh, uh, Russian countryside. So that's why hearing the criticism and, uh, and recognizing that the West is, is um, um, is ready to, 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 uh, to stand firm on the ground of moral principles might be a very good idea. And uh, I don't think that in 1981, when Reagan confronted communism, the Soviet Union was more dangerous than Russia today, Putin's Russia today. So that's why it's important to uh, uh, make strong statements. And uh, you know, the statements like Kennedy's Irbina and Berliner or Reagan's tear down this wall had a tremendous effect on those who lived on the other side of the fence. How do they try to intimidate you? How are they trying not? <laughs> it's, 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 all, it's all the time, you know, I, we, we don't even try to figure out whether our telephones are tapped. What we do is just we believe that we have to play with an open cards. Whatever I say, you know, in every meeting uh, and every uh, 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 event, the conference. So we understand it's just all goes away immediately. And they have a lot of uh, 
uh, a lot of uh, new ways of using these enormous financial resources to create uh, the atmosphere of intimidation. For instance, there are many uh, pro-Kremlin um, um, youth organizations that now are well-funded, and they play games. Uh, just uh, one of their games is they uh, create a gang of, or the band of the um, uh, young doctors, okay, they wear the white robes, and they follow us offering the psychiatric treatment, because of course everybody who is challenging Putin is, is a psycho. <laughs> uh, the latest one in the Far East, they had a competition for this young, uh, um, for this, uh, again, we call him Putin Jugend, I don't know, just, you, you name it. Uh, and um, there was a shooting competition, it was a paintball, Okay, God forbid, paintball this time. And they were, sh they were shooting at the faces of the enemies of uh, people. Uh, the motto was, vote by gun. So that's, uh, and uh, it's, it's all over the place. They follow us, they create problems, but it's, uh, it's intimidation. Now, as for our activists across the country, people losing their jobs, uh, they are um, interrogated because uh, the new Russian law on extremism is very vague and offers uh, uh, a broad explanation of the term extremism. In fact, any form of uh, uh, criticism of the current regime might be translated into one of the one of the ext one of these extremist clauses. Uh, how about uh, are there any countries uh, for the former Soviet Union that you see that are doing a good job in, in the transition to democracy? What's your favorite? Oh, we have Baltic states that uh, already joined Europe and doing absolutely great. I think Ukraine is also doing much better because in, U in Ukraine they have elections with unpredictable results. <laughs> in Russia, you know, we have a joke that in the next elections we have just two ballot boxes. One says Putin, another one says Shredder. <laughs> Gary, talk a little bit about your, your new book, uh, How Life Imitates uh, Chess, and can you elaborate on that uh, relationship between uh, life and chess? Uh, in fact, there is no relation. <laughs> it's, it's not about uh, um, uh, presenting chess as sort of the, the ultimate tool, you know, just, uh, and to have an uh, to have chess pieces used as the analogs of certain events in life. It's about decision making. It's what I learned um, as a chess player about my own decision making formula. And uh, if, if I have to just mention a few important things in the book is, A, I'm against generic advice. I do not believe that people can follow generic advice and to become better decision makers. Because decision making is as unique as fingerprints or DNA. And first, we have to be uh, we, it, it, it's about self-analysis. It's about objectivity. It's about finding out what you do best. Some people are very good in, in analyzing the data. Uh, they're very good in details. I'm not. Some are much better in, in intuitive uh, analysis of the big picture. Recognizing what is your strength and your weakness will help you to create your own decision-making formula and to create conditions where your advantages will manifest themselves while the advantages of your opponent will uh, be downplayed. Um, the success can come from very different forms of decision making. In tennis, you can have a player with a very powerful serve who is rushing to the net. Or you can have someone who's playing from the back line. Both could be number one. It, it just it, it doesn't matter. Yeah, uh, which strategy you are using, providing you are most comfortable with the strategy. And I'm explaining how I uh, learned about the um, nature of my decisions. And I'm explaining how I uh, um, apply my chess knowledge to, to, to the other areas of life. There are many examples from business, from politics, from uh, uh, military history, where I try to uh, um, apply this general knowledge that I, I accumulated into, into the concrete situations. And I hope that this book will establish a dialogue with the reader who can find out what is important for you. Because your decision-making formula is absolutely unique. And, uh, you know, drawing um, uh, some useful experience from, from another person uh, might, might be productive, but also counterproductive if this formula doesn't, it contradicts your own um, 
uh, your own beliefs. Gary, uh, congratulations for your lecture and your participation in the World Business Forum. And I uh, would like to thank you for uh, your courage to make Russia a better place and consequently to make the world a better place. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Wow. Good.